saying is this. The Bible talks about creatures that are intelligent, that are not human, that are maybe more intelligent than us, maybe more powerful than us, but don't hold the same place in creation or redemption as us. And we aren't given a lot of information on their status in terms of being image bearers. Um, I would think that they don't image God in the same way that we do if they image God at all. But if intelligence and reason and moral ability are all parts of our imaging of God, um, I think you could make a very good argument that they do image God, at least in those ways. Um, so what I'm not saying, again, is that aliens and angels are the same thing. I'm, I'm saying we have a category, biblically, for something that at, to some degree images God, um, is intelligent, and is not only peripheral to our story, um, but also isn't part of the same fall and redemption that we have going on. And we know some of them are fallen and some of them are not. Um, so I, I think that what that says or what that can offer us is saying that if aliens did exist, and if we were supposing that they do exist, we at least have a category where... Um, we know that them being intelligent or to some degree imaging God, um, having moral ability, experiencing they, their own fall, um, none of those things really conflict with the fact that the Bible's still a story about God and how he's relating to humanity. Um, we also see that we don't have a lot of information about them, which I think is also telling. So, all right, um, let's go ahead and pray and get going. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all of the good things that you give to us. We thank you for a chance to be together here tonight. We thank you for fellowship and for fun. We thank you for the church and the body that we can be encouraged, that we can come together and we can worship you, and that we can talk about you and study your word. And we thank you that your word is true, that it's edifying for us. Father, as we talk about these topics and we dive into your word um, and we're discussing these things, we pray that you would be changing us to be more like Christ, that it would be edifying to us, that we would learn more about you, but that we'd also come to know you more, and that you would be changing us by what we learn here, and that all we do as we go would be glorifying to you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's catch up. We're talking about aliens. So if you, didn't, if you were not here last week, um, we actually didn't get very far into aliens proper. The, the actual question that was posed um, in this student topic is, uh, are aliens real? I chose to not really address the question and to talk about aliens in another way. So um, kind of my argument here is I'm not sure it's super useful to speculate too far about aliens. But our real question is, if there are aliens, and if they were to show up, is that problematic for Christianity? So we started by talking about how um, in our worldview as Christians and as anybody, we have hierarchies of ideas. That means they're, they're sort of ranked. Some are more important than others. Some ideas, like the nutritional value of Twinkies was my example, um, if that information were to change tomorrow, very few other things in my life or my worldview would change. Um, it, the Twinkies don't affect a lot downstream. But there are certain ideas, like that Jesus is God and that he came to save us, his people, that if that's not true, then it affects absolutely everything. It, it's at the very core. I use the analogy of a train. Some ideas are farther to the front of the train, and if things get unhitched, you may lose the train entirely if it's a really, really important central idea. And in talking about this, we said here's some of the potential sticking points. If it were true that aliens existed, um, these are some of the things that we might see a conflict with. And one is... Uh, scripture in general, if there's a conflict with Scripture, but specifically in Scripture, it's teachings on creation, um, us as, as special things, and, and the way that uh, the Bible really just talks about earth and the things that are going on here, principally, um, and uh, the fall and how that would work in terms of if there were these extraterrestrial intelligences. Also, redemption and the atonement. Again, this is the, the life and the work of Jesus Christ, how it is that we're saved, what it is that the whole story of the Bible is really about. Um, is that affected by aliens? Then also, just in general, the, the story of the Bible, it, it doesn't seem to have a good spot for aliens in it. Like, it seems like if aliens were to show up, it wouldn't really fit with everything else that's kind of going on here. Like, it would be... Um, 
it would be odd, right? So uh, that's just almost a, a general dissonance. Is there a, a general dissonance with Christianity, and is that uh, a problem that we need to overcome or not? So as we're talking about this, we're going to kind of uh, go through these and see, is there actually a conflict with Christianity? Is this something that we really need to be concerned about? Um, or is it fine if aliens show up? And <laughs> we kind of go from there. Now, the reason that we're talking about this is because somebody submitted it as a question. Also, <laughs> there's certain things that if you submit them, we're definitely going to talk about them. Aliens happens to be one of them. Um, but also, this has been really big in our culture right now. There's lots of stuff that seems to be like huge attention draws for everybody. But we talked about last week how somebody actually submitted um, supposed bodies of aliens to the Mexican Congress. Like, they were submitted to the government of Mexico um, as evidence that not only are there aliens, but there's recovered mummified bodies of them uh, that I think were found supposedly in an archaeological site. So, like, there's that going on. You've got our own Congress talking about UFOs and, and potential uh, craft not from this world is, is some of the actual language that they're talking about. People are giving uh, testimony uh, uh, under perjury or under threat of perjury. Like, these people, if they lie about this, could go to jail. And they're saying they've been involved in alien programs in our government. There's, there's stirs, you know. This is a high point for alien talk. And I think it's important for us to, like, as things pop up in culture, we should know what we should do with them as Christians. Um, and who knows? Maybe the aliens are coming, and so we need to address this before, you know, that, that comes up, and, and we got to address it then. We want to get ahead of it, right? What? The sky is yes, the sky darkens and literally a UFO descends. Um, yes? Okay. Okay. Hold on, hold on. Um, if you were not here last week, and if you were, we tried a new thing. Um, it's a microphone. You don't have to use it, but it will um, help with our videos if you do. And it's, it's kind of fun to have a microphone. So if you have a question, raise your hand for the microphone. Go ahead. So if God, what should we call it? So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Start over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Could God have still created aliens after creation, even if it's during rest, if there were people out there to harm Cain after he murdered Abel? So are, are you, your what? question is, tell me if I'm wrong, could God have made aliens after stuff had already kind of like got going around here? Like yes. we're already post-fall, stuff's happening, he creates alien life somewhere else. Yes. Um, I don't think that that is contradictory to anything that the Bible necessarily teaches. That's actually where we're starting, is, um, is this idea of creation, the biblical idea of creation, is the idea of aliens commensurate or incommensurate with that? Yeah. I, mean, I feel like for the other side, not necessarily saying I agree with aliens, but it could be argued that since Scripture is like the inspired word of God for us, like us humans, then it's like kind of irrelevant information, you know? It's like it doesn't have to do with our salvation. Why put it in there? I think that's a great point. Um, it, we would have to ask the question, as we talk about this, is extraterrestrial life something we should expect to be in the Bible if it exists? Yeah. Um, so, I think an easy way to, I don't think, I think there's a pretty low chance that, oh, thank you. I think there's a pretty low chance that God created aliens after he, after like the fall, because didn't it say he, he already created everything? Because he created, he created everything, don't we believe that he created everything in the, um, it does tell us about everything kind of that's created here. He also doesn't name everything that he created. Um, this is a good launching point. We're, we're going to get into what Genesis says and, and some ways to kind of think about this. Um, I, I have to say, if, if you weren't here last week, what I basically led with is I think there's a very low chance that there's aliens. Um, but I also don't think it's problematic for Christianity if they do exist um, and if they show up tomorrow. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. But I tend to agree. I think there's a very low chance. Um, I'm not entertaining the question because I'm, like, convinced that there's aliens or anything like that. So, so we're on the same page about that. Um, let's get on the same page in Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 1. Right? All 
All right. Chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the heavens that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. From here, where does the creation account go? You guys tell me. Well, then, like, God, God created light on um, the first day. Or, or no. Yeah. Didn't, yeah, we just, yeah, we just read it. Then he created the earth on the second day. Well, yes. And then he created, created the waters first, I think. Then he created the land. Then he created the humans. So humans come later. Um, let's raise our hands. What what kind of comes after this? This is the we've we've kicked it off with light and dark. There's expanses being separated, waters and waters. Um, we're getting to see dry land. What's sort of the pattern following this? Yeah. Then it starts being filled. Um, what? So we went through Genesis not too long ago. Do you, does anybody remember sort of how it's um, broken down as we go down through there. We've got the various kinds of creatures in the various kinds of places that those creatures would live, right? Like he goes to the water and the fish and the birds of the air. Um, there's, there's all of these sort of like animal kingdoms and the, the animals that inhabit them. And then he finally does get down to human beings. Um, yeah. So on the first three days he made the... It, he made the three, like, essentially areas. And then on the second three days, he filled them. But on the last two days, he made creatures to fill the areas. Would it be safe to say, or, like, would it be an assumption that's not, like, against the Bible to say that he might have put made aliens on the fourth day with the planets? Um, well, I think you could probably, if aliens are being created during this time, it would be difficult to speculate which day it was that they were being created on. Um, and, and if there are aliens, I think that that might influence the way that we would um, I interpret Genesis 1 in terms of um, how do we see the days and, and is it a comprehensive list that we're getting um, or is it a general list that we're getting in terms of what's being made and when it's being made. But you have a, a general pattern of um, certain kinds of animals being made in the certain kinds of places that they inhabit. And then at the very end, God makes man in his own image. Um, he's showing a separation for human beings, right? You get a, uh, an aside. So in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. There's a, a, a poem or a song that's set aside talking about human beings specifically being made in the image of God. Um, and that's important. And directly after that, in starting in chapter 2, you get sort of a, a shift on perspective, focusing in on mankind, their place in the garden, and the things that God entails from them, and the things that God is going to do for them. He pronounces blessings and promises, um, and he tells them there's one thing that they can't do, uh, God covenants with these people. So you get sort of a, a really wide-sweeping view of, in some sense, the, the fundamentals are made, and then in growing specificity, you have areas of creation, the things that inhabit them, and then zooming all the way in on humankind. And this is really bringing into focus, okay, this is what the story is going to be concerning, is primarily the relationship of God and his people. Um, yeah? Hear me out. Where did the light come from? A UFO? <laughs> Just saying. You bring up a good point in terms of um, there is a marked lack of scientific detail about this. Um, I, I think it's a huge mistake to try to read Genesis 1 in terms of 
Um, this has a scientific document, the way that Western people would write a scientific document uh, here in the 20th or 21st century. It's not that. What it is, is primarily a theological text. Um, it's historic, it really happened, it's telling the truth, but what is the main point of Genesis 1, do you think? It's the story of creation, true. Do you think it's teaching, uh, like, is there a message to Genesis 1? Or is it simply a record? I think it's a message showing us that God is the creator. Yeah, there's, this is setting up the kind of God that we're dealing with here, right? This was recorded by Moses. So this is coming to us from Moses' hand after the Exodus. And it is a, an account of this, the great I am, the, the creator God who came and took his people out of Egypt and who brought them unto himself and is redeeming them into a kingdom. And out of this is going to be the one, Jesus, who saves the whole world, right? All of his people from all time and begins this new creation. So we're getting an account of the I am. And part of it is it's a, it's a record of this is what happened. It's also saying who God is, that he is the master of the universe. He created everything. Remember that in the ancient Near East, Egypt, for instance, you had gods who were like God of the sun, God of the moon, God of the water, God of the Nile, God of this, God of that. Um, by going through all of the arenas of creation, it's saying not just who God is, but who all of the other gods are not. It's saying God is the one who is the master of the sun and the moon and of everything else, who made all creatures and made human beings. He is totally sovereign. He is the one creator God. There's a polemic aspect to Genesis in that it's, um, it's teaching against the other religions that are around and against all religions. There is only one God who made everything, and he is master of the universe. It also puts human beings in a very special place. They are distinct and separate from all of the other creatures that are made. And that's where there's a special focus given on them uh, in Genesis 2. I think I saw, we got lots of questions. Yeah. Maddox was first. Maddox, go ahead. So if the light was UFOs. <laughs> Next. So, no, no, no. He, he, no, no, hear me out. Okay. So follow it, like the UFO sightings in like Nevada and whatnot. What if these were instead angels and the light was God creating the, the first and second and third layers of heaven before all of creation? Okay, you also raise a very important point. I don't think Genesis 1 or any of it was given to us to try to speculate about hidden messages that are in it. Um, Whatever is written in scripture, while it may take some studying to understand it, is meant to speak to the original audience and to God's people for all time. So the, the theological message there and the real history isn't going to have a coded message about aliens in it. What that would like be a onion? huge misunderstanding of, say, Revelation or of Genesis. Um, and that's kind of my point, yeah. What if it's like an onion with multiple layers? Like you peel it back, the creation story, and suddenly there's aliens. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a very multi-layered onion. Um, <laughs> Read between the lines, Daniel. That's, it that's says not, that's aliens. That's not how it works. Um, Matthew, do we have... Let's do some real questions. Y'all, real is a real question? Okay. Are you saying I'm not serious about this? Yes. This is going on record. Okay. So if there were aliens, yes. would they still have sanctification and repentance? Good question. We're going to get to that. I'm going to put that one on pause. Yep. That's going to be here. So, that's kind of, that was kind of my, this is kind of a question, but, um, so, so yeah, did, did, did the aliens did the aliens become sinners, or would you, or were they? Do you think, do you think that humans are still special, and that aliens are technically considered in the animal class? Great questions. Um, I'm going to get to that in moments. Um, we're gonna we're gonna address that specifically. 
All right, one more. Sander. Anderson. Um, kind of following up on him, does that mean like aliens do not have souls or do they have souls? Um, uh, so again, we'll get to that. Um, let's, we're going to get to the image of God aspect to the potential aliens. But let's just talk um, real broadly about creation first, and then I'm going to get to those questions. So what I'm getting at is there is, there is a record in Genesis. There's also a message in Genesis. Um, but the record of Genesis is not trying to explain every bit of what was made or exactly how it was made but rather that God comprehensively made all things, right? And specifically, where does man fit in the hierarchy of things? Uh, Creation was not just made haphazardly. It was made in an orderly way. There's an order to everything that God does, and he has ordered everything. That's that's a lot of what the message here is. Um, Hold on. We got to make a little bit of ground before more questions. So, that being said, there's, there's a, a theological message. Part of it is a polemic. Part of it is historical. Um, and there are different ways of Orthodox Christianity understanding the first chapter of Genesis. So the PCA, our denomination, did a study committee report um, examining different ways of understanding the first chapter of Genesis, different views on creation, as it were, and coming up with some guidance for PCA churches as to what would fall in the realm of orthodoxy and what would not. They ended up coming up with a handful of views that they said you could hold these and you would be um, not only consistent with an orthodox understanding of scripture, but also with um, the, the orthodoxy of Christianity way back. There was a variety of views on Genesis all the way back. They did come up with some things that are immovable in your view of Genesis. So let me read you something real quick and I'll pull a couple things out of it. So this is from that study committee report. It says, all the committee members join in these affirmations. The scriptures, and hence Genesis 1 through 3, are the inerrant word of God. That Genesis 1 through 3 is a coherent account from the hand of Moses. That history, not myth, is the proper category for describing these chapters. And furthermore, that their history is true. In these chapters, we find the record of God's creation of the heavens and the earth, ex nihilo, that is out of nothing of the special creation of Adam and Eve as actual human beings, the parents of all humanity. Hence, they are not the products of evolution from lower forms of life. We further find the account of an historical fall that brought all humanity into an estate of sin and misery, and of God's sure promise of a redeemer. Because the Bible is the word of the creator and governor of all that there is, it is right for us to find it speaking authoritatively to matters studied by historical and scientific research. We also believe that acceptance of, say, non-geocentric astronomy, that is, that Earth isn't the center of everything, is consistent with full submission to biblical authority. We recognize that a naturalistic worldview and true Christian faith are impossible to reconcile and gladly take our stand with biblical supernaturalism. So that's a summary statement of things that they're kind of saying, okay, any view that you take has to agree with that in order to fall into... Um, a sort of a a PCA-approved kind of orthodoxy, and I would say biblical orthodoxy. Key points there, that this is scripture, it's inerrant, that it's coherent, um, that it was written by Moses, and that it's historic and true, that God created out of nothing, that Adam and Eve are actual people, and that they were a special creation, and that there was a real historical fall. Now, I don't think that any of those things, if you hold those to be true, it couldn't also be true that there's other other intelligent life. Um, And I will get to that in just a second. But first, I want to address um, the the likelihood or the high probability um, that there aren't aliens. So a lot of this discussion centers around Uh, the Fermi Paradox, which basically says there's all of this space, there's all of this expanse, there's all of these planets. Many of them are somewhat similar to Earth when you talk about like the whole expanse of the universe. Um, How is it that we haven't found aliens yet? They haven't found us. We haven't been able to communicate them. Like, where is everybody? And people have come up with equations to sort of measure the likelihood that there's alien life given the expanse of the universe. And yet, despite like recent 
alien mummies that I don't believe are actual alien mummies. Um, there, there are, there's no like alien encounter. If, if they're here, they're very like secretive and it's a weird sort of situation. Um, I think there's every reason to believe that God would make a gigantic universe and not just fill it with life. Um, I, I think it would be fine if he did, and it would be evidence of his goodness just being spread further. But there are good reasons to think that he wouldn't. So one is just aesthetic reasons. We get a lot of teaching about like the vastness of God and the universe and who he is and, and the great expanse of the stars and our place as creatures in the realm of the creator from the, the vastness of space. I think it gives us places to go um, that maybe the intention is for us to leave this planet and, and colonize other planets and become, I don't know, um, like a galactic uh, whatever. Um, there's, no reason, there's no reason why that couldn't be the case. Um, also, uh, Jonathan Edwards makes a couple of arguments about why it might be that God makes a giant universe and only us as intelligent life. Um, so you may or may not know this, but John Edwards has a stance on aliens. Um, I got this from a paper called uh, Jonathan Edwards and the Aliens. So he basically says a couple of things. Edwards says, with the doctrine of election, this planet we dwell upon may, nevertheless, be as it were elected to infinitely greater and more imperp important purposes, that is, than the other planets. Like, it's almost like a, a tiny lesson on how God takes a remnant and saves them, that we have this earth, this one earth that can sustain life and is very, very, very special in the huge expanse of the universe, and God is centering his, his attention on it at the exclusion of all else. Um, it, it could be a parallel to the idea of how God does that for us, that he chooses us not because we're special in and of ourselves, but because he's chosen to dote over us. He's adopted us as his children through the work of his son, who he sent to sacrifice on our behalf. Um, we are special and particular and almost peculiar in that way in that God has chosen to do that for us out of grace alone, out of nothing that we have done. He also goes on to say, um, it's, it's an instance of the lesser being chosen above the greater. God's paternal care in favor of children above potentates. You guys know what a potentate is? It's like a powerful person, you know, like a ruler. Um, children over potentates. Um, uh, though a prince might have more riches and human influence than a child, a poor child may be infinitely more made of by God. Um, so, again, pointing to the fact that God over and over doesn't choose the firstborn, but he chooses the secondborn, the one who didn't have the place of honor, that he makes the, the thinking of the wise foolishness in Christ, that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That the fact that our planet is exclusive may be just a, almost like an object lesson or more in the same pattern of the way that God chooses particular things out of many things um, and does wonderful things with them. Yeah? Um, <laughs> I will answer that question later. Wait, wait, um, wait. Was it aliens? It was aliens. That's the answer. Um, that's actually the big, the big reveal was that I have an alien in the closet there, and he's the one that put the shovel there. Okay. So I think there is um, every reason to think that there aren't aliens. But if you assume that there are, we're now going into aliens exist realm, okay? So travel with me. We now live in a universe where there is um, extraterrestrial intelligence. Okay. How would they fall in this created order? Well, we actually have a biblical category for intelligent things that are not human, that are part of creation. Does anybody know what those are? Angels. Um, Angels and demons. There are spiritual beings that exist, according to the Bible. In fact, the New Testament talks about angels a lot and doesn't give us a lot of information about them. So two things there. You have a, a created thing. We aren't really told their status in terms of the image of God. Sometimes they're described as sons of God. Um, we know that they're heavenly beings. 
Uh, we know that they are in some ways like us and that they're intelligent. In some ways, they're more powerful than us. Uh, Satan is described as more crafty than all of the other creatures. Seems to include us. He, he definitely tricked um, Adam and Eve there. Um, these angels, they're kind of like, they seem like they can blip in and out. Um, they're terrifying when they show up. Like, people are tempted to worship them or flee from them. They're in fear. They're always saying, like, wait, don't be afraid. I'm here on God's behalf. It's all right. So wait, these are... Are you, are you trying to say that aliens are angels? I'm not saying that aliens are angels. They're, they're demons? L- hold on. <laughs> what I'm saying is this. The Bible talks about creatures that are intelligent, that are not human, that are maybe more intelligent than us, maybe more powerful than us, but don't hold the same place in creation or redemption as us. And we aren't given a lot of information on their status in terms of being image bearers. Um, I would think that they don't image God in the same way that we do if they image God at all. But if intelligence and reason and moral ability are all parts of our imaging of God, um, I think you could make a very good argument that they do image God, at least in those ways. Um, So what I'm not saying, again, is that aliens and angels are the same thing. I'm, I'm saying we have a category, biblically, for something that at, to some degree images God, um, is intelligent, and is not only peripheral to our story, um, but also isn't part of the same fall and redemption that we have going on. And we know some of them are fallen and some of them are not. Um, so I, I think that what that says or what that can offer us is saying that if aliens did exist, and if we were supposing that they do exist, we at least have a category where um, we know that them being intelligent or to some degree imaging God, um, having moral ability, experiencing their own fall, um, none of those things really conflict with the fact that the Bible's still a story about God and how he's relating to humanity. Um, We also see that we don't have a lot of information about them, which I think is also telling. So if they exist, we could maybe have a category for them. Um, What about the the silence of the Bible about them. Like, wouldn't that be big news? Um, maybe? Maybe not. So just like Genesis is a, a story about who God is, where mankind um, sits in his created order, uh, his relation to us, and it, it kicks off the story in terms of telling us who God is in, in relation to who the nations say that God is, but also sort of the the origin story of humanity and how we got to where we are, it's not primarily about how everything is made up, like atoms and molecules and and the laws of uh, nature, as we call them, and and all of those things. Um, It's, generally speaking, silent on those things. Just so, the story of the redemption of humanity and of Christ and what he's accomplished for us, his people, is really about us and God, right? And it, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for it to be spending a lot of time talking about what God is doing with other people. I think that's why we don't get a ton of information about angels, even though they come into the story. We don't really know what happened in terms of Satan and the demons and what happened with what they were doing. Um, something to think about um, as a, an illustration. Have you guys read uh, A Horse and His Boy? By C.S. Lewis. Uh, who, uh, who here has read it? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. I actually just read it recently. Well, one of, one of my favorites in this series, there's a scene in the book where there's an army coming into Narnia, and they've got to get word, and they've just been attacked, and the boy, who is the boy in the horse and his boy title, um, he's walking, and it's like dark, and it's scary, and he's been through a lot, and he hears something walking beside him. And he's been chased by lions, like, all through the story. And, and he doesn't know that it's actually, well, no spoilers. Um, but so he's like, oh, no, it's a lion, and it's going to get me. In fact, a lion scratched up his good friend who was traveling with him not too long ago. So he's, like, scared. But as he's walking and he hears this thing padding along beside him, he starts talking to it. And it turns out to be Aslan, who is the Christ figure in those stories, if you don't know the stories. And they start talking, and he starts explaining the sort of Aslan's perspective on the journey that he's been on. And 
this is part of their conversation. He says, then it was you who wounded Erebus. Erebus is his friend who was attacked by a lion. It was I. But what for? Child, said the voice, I am telling you your story, not hers. I tell no one any story but his own. Who are you? asked Shasta, the boy. Myself, said the voice, very deep and low, so that the earth shook. And again, myself, loud and clear and gay. And then a third time, myself, whispered so softly you could hardly hear it. And yet it seemed to come from all around you as if the leaves rustled with it. Which, I love that, because it's, it's like an I am statement. He says it three times to reiterate it. Um, that he's saying he is the creator, he is the redeemer. Um, but did you catch that? He says, don't be concerned with what I'm doing in that person's life. Be concerned with what I'm doing in your life. This is something we kind of see throughout Scripture in terms of you should look first to yourself before you look to other people. Um, that it, what, what it comes down to for each Christian is where you stand before God in your story. You're not supposed to measure yourself against other people. Jesus tells a parable about workers where there's some workers that come like really early in the day and they start working this field and they agree upon a price with the owner of the vineyard. And they're out there working, but like the work's not getting finished. So he keeps hiring more people as the day goes on. He hires them all for the same price as those who started working at the very beginning of the day. So by the end of the day, you have some people that worked like an hour and some people that worked 10 hours and they're all getting paid the same amount. And the people who got there early were like, what's the deal with that? That seems unfair, doesn't it? And the answer is, what is it to you what I'm paying them? Um, what we agreed upon is what we agreed upon. And there's a few different things that come out of that, that parable's teaching, but part of it is um, God's redemption, his grace on us is between us and God and not anybody else. Somebody who comes to the faith when they're 50 years old uh, is the same amount part of the kingdom as somebody who has served God their whole life. Um, it, it doesn't make a difference in terms of what somebody else receives in terms of grace from God and what you receive in terms of grace, uh, in terms of grace from God. There's a sense in which um, your story is your story, and Aslan only talks to you about your story. I think there's something there in terms of the whole story, the whole narrative of the Bible is about us and God. And I don't think it's as weird that aliens aren't in it, if they existed, as if there were aliens in it, if they exist. Because that's not really what the story's about. This story was given to us so that we could know how to be made right with God and what he's been doing in the life of his people and what he's going to be doing in a new creation going forward. If there was like all these asides like, oh, by the way, at some point somebody's going to discover that the earth isn't the center of the universe. Um, and then at another point we're going to discover that there's more life out there. Or it, There would be all these weird like, why, why is that in the story? Um, I don't think it would make a lot of sense for God to be telling us about extraterrestrial intelligences. Um, and I think that's why we don't hear a lot about angels and what um, God is doing with them, um, what that's going to look like. Thoughts on that? Questions? Okay, so if aliens do show up, I think we have this like um, sense that's just given to us that if aliens show up, the jig is up. All of like human things were basically, you know, nonsense. And these aliens are going to come with a higher knowledge and more power and like everything changes. I don't think that we should necessarily assume that. If you assume that the Bible is true, and that the Christian worldview is correct, and I think that we have every reason to believe that it is, and I think we should operate as though it is, I think that we could actually be optimistic about aliens if they showed up. That why wouldn't they also know God? Why would we assume that that would change everything um, if their existence doesn't conflict with the, the existence of God or what he's doing here on earth um, or who we are in light of what Christ has done? Then we should probably expect them to show up with at least some knowledge of who God is from general revelation and maybe special revelation too. We might have Christian aliens coming um, to evangelize us, which um, would be weird. Yeah, question. So that's. Um, I, I have a doubt they're going to heaven. But so, like, so like, it's, so like, it's like, isn't there something called, like, Gimlin? Like, Gimlin's going to heaven? Like, Christian, like, Justin's going to heaven? 
Yeah, so as far as we know, the only people that are going to be in heaven are going to be people who have been united to Christ in this life. So um, will that include angels? I have to maybe assume that they're going to be there too. Um, it's, it's silent on whether there are other redeemed creatures, but what we know for certain is the only way for us to be in the new creation is to be saved by the blood of Jesus and put our faith in him and follow him. Yeah. So, I, I would think that I would think that angels would be there because they're already in heaven to be saved. I would think so too, but they're not redeemed. Yes. So you're saying if aliens are out there, it's likely that they already know Christ through other means. Um we're about to get to that one, but I'm saying I, I don't think there's any reason to assume that aliens showing up would like somehow bring um like would upset everything else that we know, including Christianity, especially if it doesn't conflict with Christianity. And that we'd have every belief, every reason to believe that if God made intelligent creatures on another planet, that he would reveal himself to them in some way. If so, he would do that, though, yeah. why would he not do so with the North and South Americans before the, fifth, before the 16th century? So the, the Bible teaches that he has revealed himself through creation to everyone who's alive, that he has written his law on their hearts, and that everyone has a certain innate knowledge of God. Um, But that's also in terms of the way that he's revealed himself and is saving our creation, or our earth. Um, So I I don't know that he wouldn't reveal himself in different ways to to different groups of people. Just like he has in different ways to different groups of people through our time. Um, Like, Revelation hasn't all come at once to all people everywhere. It was very steady and gradual and started very small. Started with Israel, right? Um, and before that with just a small family. Um, lots of questions. Okay, let's go quick. Yes. So, with the aliens, yes. if, do you think that if they, like, already knew God and had, like, what if, if they had, like, their own Bible and, like, they were saved or whatever, if they were going to heaven, and if they, like, believed in God, would that make everybody in the world start to become more Christian or would it just set them in their ways and be like, uh, I hate God, so I'm not going to turn into a Christian. Do you think more people are like totally against it or would be changed if aliens believed in God? Um, I think that those who have ears to hear will have ears to hear that that God has to do something in you to make you receptive to the gospel, and that no amount of evidence, even if God himself were to appear, it wouldn't convince somebody who isn't able to be convinced because their heart hasn't been changed. So I think God will continue to save people the way he saves people. Um, I think it would be more evidence, but I think there's a preponderance of evidence already, and people still don't believe. So um, you know what? We don't have a lot of time. So if y'all have questions, questions, just ask me so afterward, relevant. and we'll get to your questions. My question um, very relevant. Because we're not spending another week on this. I gotta, I gotta get through. What? Oh, we'll get to. You can talk to me after. So. I have a burning question. I'm going to. I wanted us to look at a couple places that talk about the atonement, but we know that what Jesus Christ did is that he was incarnate. He took on flesh. He came. He lived a perfect life. He died for our sins. He was raised again, truly and actually. He's right now sitting at the right hand of the Father. And that our hope and our trust is that what he has done in his perfect life and his death and his resurrection is that he is the first of a new kind. He is the new Adam in a new creation. That he lives a life for us that we can't live. That he dies for our sins. And that he is alive again as a first fruit of what we are going to experience in a new creation. Now, are aliens sinful? Um, Can they be saved? I think that we could basically just imagine the the scenarios and say, is this a problem for Christianity? Scenario one, um, we fell and all creation fell. So I think that's an important point. Any real scenario, um, Romans says that all creation is longing, is groaning, for redemption, for a new creation. I I think everything has been impacted by the fall. Everything. So things alive, things not alive. I think all creation is impacted and all of us are impacted. I don't think it's impossible for all of creation to be impacted, but other intelligent creatures to possibly not be. 
So C.S. Lewis pictures this in his space trilogy that um, some people go and they visit another planet and they actually find different um, aliens, intelligent life forms that image God in different ways and that never did experience the fall. So they may have a different covenantal arrangement with God or whatever it is um, and it's possible there's unfallen aliens. That really doesn't mess with the fact that we fell and that it impacted everything and that we need a redemption and that the, the redemption of Jesus is effective for us. Scenario two, um, they count as humans in terms of the fall. So they all fall under Adam. If that's the case, aliens exist and they fell in the fall, then they could also be redeemed through Christ. And um, that could be in his one-time sacrifice here, or I don't think it's incommensurate with Christianity that um, God could become incarnate multiple times or in multiple different places. One um, reason that I think that is because uh, most people who are Orthodox Christians believe that there were past incarnations. So um, Jacob wrestling with God. We think that that's a kind of incarnation of God. Um, the other person who's in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Um, I would think that that is um, a, a, an incarnate Christ uh, pre-incarnation. So um, it could be that they've got sort of their, their own redemptive story going on alongside our redemptive story of the fall and that they fell through Adam, um, but it's ultimately that they're saved through Christ. No problem with Christianity. Um, third one is that all intelligent life has fallen, but they didn't all fall through Adam. So Alvin Plantica, a philosopher, actually puts forth this theory that any free agent, so anybody who has free will, who's a moral creature, at some point with enough of them, somebody's going to transgress God's law, and that falls are inevitable in pre-redeemed intelligent creatures everywhere. So they did their own fall, and they get their own redemption. Um, again, that's not really a problem for Christianity. So their status in terms of the fall, any conceivable scenario of a fall with aliens, I think no problem for Christianity. Um, and, and then they would have some sort of redemption that would go along with their fall, depending on which category it went in. Did that answer some questions? Any questions about that? Yes. So, the, another scenario you hit at is that they're actually animals, like I was saying before. Okay. I think I, I personally think that aliens are animals, and if they're if they are, I don't think you're saying everything knows Christ. Do the animals know Christ? Do you think do you think the animals know Christ? Um, so I don't think that they know him in a salvific way. I think that all animals have um, sort of an innate relationship to God as his creatures. But no, I don't think they're, they have the intelligence or the moral agency. So if we're imagining something that has the intelligence and the moral agency, um, then it would be an issue for them. If they're just animals, uh, we're probably never going to encounter them because they would never get here. So, so again, that would not conflict, but yeah. Okay. And then we just said never mind you. Okay. So <laughs> sorry. I got you. This is making me so worried. I'm sorry. Put your hands back right. Is that your question? So if you said sorry. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay. Do you have a question or not? I, I I do actually have a question. Okay. If Jesus was incarnate yes. before his creation as a birth of Mary, is that because So there's there's different views on this, um, and and I don't. So different views of that is okay. Jesus is outside of time; that he, he's always, in some sense, been incarnate, and it's not like um, the flesh that he had when he was born to Mary is the same situation as when he's appearing in other times of history. That he doesn't incarnate in the same way. Some people believe that there was one incarnation, but because he also exists outside of time, that it's, it's the same incarnate body at those different times. Um, or it, 
it could be a pre-incarnation of God that isn't Christ. That's what some people believe. I'm saying um, I tend to think that that's maybe just speculation beyond what we really, any of those, none of those conflict with um, the fundamentals. All right, we got to keep going. So no conflict, no conflict. Um, does it conflict with, with the total narrative of the Bible? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I gave you uh, sort of the reason that there, there's, this is our story. Um, there's a long history of Christians who have no issue with their being aliens. Some of the popes have addressed it. Not that I'm recommending what the popes are saying. Um, but Billy Graham, um, he famously said that he would offer to baptize them if they wanted to be baptized. Um, no issue there. So uh, all the way back to Aquinas. Um, it, even in the medieval times, they were speculating about life on other planets and what the implications would be. Um, what I want you to, to rest assured of is that what matters to us is how God is working in our lives, in our world, and it's not problematic if aliens do exist, and it's probably not fruitful to spend too much time speculating about whether or not they do and how all of that would look. Um, if we get back to the very fundamental things, the, the things that really matter to us, what we can do by looking at those saying if something doesn't conflict with those things, if it doesn't hugely impact the way we should be living our lives, what we should be pursuing um, in, in our day-to-day -day and in our long-term plans. Like, we can't plan on aliens appearing or not appearing. Um, but you could conceivably spend a lot of energy thinking about it and worrying about it and speculating about it that should be spent in other areas. So I want to show you if, you, if you boil it down to not just an amorphous, um, what if aliens were real? And what would that mean for this? Or what would that mean for that? Um, it, it doesn't conflict with God as our creator, with, with the fall, with the atonement, um, with the story in general. It, it doesn't disprove scripture. And so that's probably as far as we really need to go with it. Um, there are things like this that are very, very interesting to people. Now, things like aliens or... Um, a lot of like conspiracies in general. So there are political ones that fall into this. There are just like wacko ones that fall into this. There's things like flat earth. They have certain qualities to them that they share with religion. We are all religious creatures. We crave religion because we were made to be religious. Um, we were made to be in relationship to God and to know him and to live in light of what he's doing. But all of these things, they have like mystery, there's a, a sense of the transcendent, like a sense that if aliens were to exist, it would, it would change everything. Um, or they're so far above and beyond us, it would, it would revolutionize what human beings are. Um, there are certain parts of it that you're just not going to know, so it's mysterious. There's an apocalyptic sense to it. It might be the end of everything if aliens show up. Um, that has an appeal to people. That there's a purpose to it, like we have to find the truth. Um, we have to know if they're real. And it, it's going to solve everything if it happens to be true. If you pay attention, most good capturing news stories are going to have some of these elements. And there are different ways that you can be sucked into these things and actually devote large portions of your life to things that offer those sorts of things. There's usually some kind of like rituals involved with it. There's sacred stories. There's a kind of worship. There's a whole cosmology that is how you see the universe. Um, there's usually rules, and there's some kind of organization that you can become a part of. These are all things that we should properly be participating in with the church and with Scripture and with God himself. Um, and so we want to be careful of going after anything that's offering all of those elements and giving a lot of our, like, for lack of a better term, our religious energies to that thing versus the one true religion, which is Christianity. We are called to seek God's kingdom first, and we don't need to be anxious about all of these other things that we spend a lot of time worshiping and speculating about. Um, and so aliens probably doesn't capture a lot of you, but there are pagan religions out there that our culture is offering in all sorts of different shapes and sizes that have these different elements to them. And it's, it's good for us to filter these things out by using the central parts of our worldview and saying, is this pertinent to what scripture is teaching or is it not?
and maybe not spending so much time on those things that are not and refocusing on what is most important. This is like the golden age of conspiracies. And I think it's, it's important for you guys, like soon my generation is gonna be the old ones that don't know what's going on, but AI is coming up. There are more conspiracy theories available now, I think, than ever before. And they're drawing people in. There are a lot of flat earthers, okay? And there you go. There are a lot of flat earthers. That's surprising and not surprising because it offers these sorts of elements. Um, you guys are going to have to be very, very discerning about information as it comes out. There's a, an era coming in like years probably where we're not gonna know what videos are real and what they're not. If people really said what they said or not. There's deep fakes that show people saying things that they're not saying. There's probably gonna be an alien landing made by AI that looks very, very convincing. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is the beginning. I, I think we're verging on an era where you're gonna have to use this kind of a strategy where, where you're going back to the very basics. What do I know most centrally, most truly, and how am I interacting with all of these other things that are popping up trying to grab your attention? How do we filter those out and deal with them? And it's going back to what is most important, what is most central, and what we're called to do. We're called to follow after God. It's also the case that the more extraordinary the thing being claimed is, the more extraordinary evidence you need to believe it. We need to get to a place where we apologetically, um, in terms of our walk with Christ, in terms of just our general knowledge of Scripture, where we have a very, very firm grasp on like the essentials. We have very, very clear ways of dealing with our doubts. We have clear paths out of any kind of like doubt pits that we might fall into um, so that we can deal with like a huge amount of informational uncertainty that I think is here and is coming in more kind of full ways. Um, no time for questions. I'm gonna close this out with Ephesians chapter one. Turn over there. I wanna hear it afterward. Um, okay, Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. I've, uh, I've ended on this. This is like maybe my favorite passage. It's up there. Um, we've ended on it before, but I think it's pertinent to this. This is Paul's thanksgiving and prayer for the Ephesians. It says, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward those, towards us who believe. According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is like, it's a prayer, but it's almost a benediction. It's a, it's a desire that Paul has for the Ephesians not to like notice, behave perfectly, not just to know all of the mysteries of the universe. It's to know God. It's, it's to grow in the wisdom of the Lord. It, it's to, to know him in such a way that it's not just information. You can know facts and you can know people. And what God wants for us is to know about him and about his creation, but also to know him, to walk with him, to spend time in his word and in prayer, in conversation with him to know him in the way that he's been faithful in your life over time and in the life of all of his people over time. Paul is praying that the Ephesians would experience the joy and the peace of being in a good relationship with God that is ongoing. That kind of a relationship, that kind of a knowledge can defeat a lot of other misinformation. Somebody comes and tells me lies about somebody who I hold dear, who I trust a lot. It's going to take a lot of evidence for me to convince me that they're lying to me. Why? Because I know them, because I trust them.
Because there's, there's more there than just information. There's history, and there's love, and there's community. If we know God and we're walking with him, it's going to help us deal with everything. Um, that's, that's the call of the Christian is to know him, to become more like him, and to follow him. And yes, he does want our obedience. I'm not saying that he doesn't. But I'm saying at the core of our obedience is our gratitude and our love of God. We're called to know him and to seek his face over and over and over again. There's so many things that can absorb our time and our attention and our affections. And the call of the Christian is to be constantly looking back to Christ, looking back to the cross, making sure we're spending time where it really needs to be spent on the most essential things. Like if you've got extra energy after you've really spent time with God and you've pursued real relationships and you've done those things that are required of you day to day and then you want to speculate about aliens or read about QAnon or whatever. Like maybe then, but are we really prioritizing what we're supposed to be prioritizing? Are, are we really spending our energy on the kingdom of God and our, who we are in relation to him? Um, or are we spending it elsewhere? Uh, this is protective. It's edifying. It's our call. So we need to seek Christ first. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness, and especially the goodness that you have shown through your son, Jesus Christ, and what he has accomplished for us. Father, we want to know you. We need your help in, in this uncertain world. Help us to build our house on the rock, on the sure things of who you are and who you've made us to be. And help us to follow after you with the surety that we get from the gospel of peace. Help us to stand firm and, and to walk after you, our King. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.